I uh, did something this week that I don't normally do. And, well, I listen to God, first of all. I try to listen to him. But I changed my sermon. About Wednesday, I was praying through the sermon that I was going to give on Nehemiah. And God spoke to my heart and just said, I think this is what these folks need to hear. This doesn't happen a lot. If you have your Bibles, turn to me with, uh, with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I don't know if you knew this or not, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is the longest portion in Scripture dealing with, with giving. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, giving. I think that the passage we're going to look at can be a very exciting passage. Because when we discover the principle that God wants us to have in our hearts, I think you'll discover that giving back to God You'll have an overflowing joy when you give, no matter what it is, whether it's your time, your talents, or your treasure. Because giving doesn't always talk about money. It does talk about time and talents as well. Now, when the subject of Christian giving is mentioned, I think most people, probably even in this room, think about tithing, don't they? Tithing. And there's nothing wrong with tithing. But we're going to find this morning that in the New Testament, there's a much higher standard than the tithe. You see, <coughs> under the law of Moses, the children of Israel acknowledged God's ownership in their lives and property by the payment of a tithe. It was an obligation that was placed on everyone, but it was under the law. Under the law. If you didn't pay your tithe in the Old Testament, you were a lawbreaker. And actually, when we look at the tithe, we find that there were three tithes commanded under the law. The first tithe was to pay tithes to the Levites for their service on behalf of God in the tabernacle. Now, now who were the Levites? Well, the Levites were the sons of Jacob, the descendants of, of Jacob's son Levi. They served in the temple. Now, how did they serve? Well, they did various things. They, they played music. They were the guards at the door. They were the ones who packed up the temple and carried it out when they decided to, to move the temple somewhere else. Second one was, let me see if I get this thing working here. There was a tithe for the feasts and sacrifices, which the offerer himself and his family were to eat in the presence of the Lord at the tabernacle. And you find this in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 14. And I want to read that to you because it's a very interesting passage. It says, You shall tithe all the fields of your seeds that come from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry your tithe, when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there. 
Then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that your Lord your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire. Oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves. And you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. And then the third tithe was a tithe that was given every third year to the poor. And again, this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 14, where it says this, At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of the hands, your hands that you do. So we see in these three that the tithe was an obligation. It was under the law that you were to give a tithe. But in addition, if God blessed you richly, some people gave an offering above that tithe. Well, in the Old Testament, we find that many of the Old Testament people disobeyed God. They did not bring their tithes as was commanded by the law. So Malachi had a message. And you've all heard this message. I'm sure if you've gone to church and you've heard a message on tithing, you've heard it out of Malachi. And the message was, have you robbed God? Let me read it to you out of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, or as the King James says, offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And whereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down on you a blessing until there is no more need. Many seek to apply these passages to the Christians today. And I think we can glean principles from this. But you know what, folks? We're not under the law today. We're under grace. Praise God for that. You see, there is no command. There's no commandment in the New Testament from Jesus or the apostles that says the Christian must tithe. Why? Because we're not under the law. We're under grace. We couldn't live as Christians under that law. Jesus fulfilled that for us. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, you are not under the law but under grace. So if a believer decides to give a tithe to the Lord Jesus out of his, out of his heart, praise God. That's wonderful. You're at liberty to do that, and I believe that God will bless you if you give him a tenth. But don't do it because we don't, uh, we're not under the, that legal obligation. But uh, here's what I do believe. And test me on this. I believe that as Christians, we're to use the tithe as a measuring stick. <clears throat> J. Vernon McGee said this. I can't believe that any Christian today who has a good income should give less than a tenth. 
I agree with you. I agree with you. <coughs> so here's the big question. What is the standard for Christian giving under the grace? Well, if you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to show you the first essential of giving. Listen to what the first seven verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 says. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. <laughs> Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had stated, so we should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. The first essential of Christian giving is giving of ourselves to God. When Paul was on his third missionary journey, one of his main projects was to collect for the poverty-stricken saints in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know why they were so poor. Maybe it was because of of famine, maybe because it was persecution, maybe a combination of reasons, but we just don't know. He didn't put it in his letter. But we do know there was an extreme need. Paul was visiting the Gentiles, Gentiles in, in Macedonia and southern Greece, towns like Philippi and Thessalonica, and he asked them to support these fellow believers in Jerusalem. Paul is writing to the Corinthians to urge them to help them. Now Paul is saying, it's time to complete what you started a year ago. A year ago. And in chapter 8, he starts using the Macedonian Christians as an example for us to encourage us to give generously, just as they gave generously. Paul says this. He says, and now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Even though these believers were poor in monetary things, they excelled in their generosity to help other people. In their material wealth that they had, they were willing, they willingly gave it to others. So a key word in these two chapters is the word grace. Grace. In fact, it occurs ten times in these two chapters. Paul did not say that they gave so generously because they merely had a warm-hearted concern or that they had a sweet spirit, Paul says they gave out of grace because they loved these folks, because of the grace that God had given them. You see, the credit belongs to God, not to the individuals. And folks, when we give of ourselves, of the time that 
God has allowed us to have on this earth. We're giving out of grace. One thing that made the contribution so impressive was the circumstances in which they gave out of the most severe trial. You see, these folks were hated by unbelievers. They were in serious economic need. They did not allow that to deter them, though, because they gave a portion of what they had. They were overflowing with joy because of their suffering. They appreciated what God allowed them to have. They gave out of their poverty. They gave out of their affliction. They gave with great joy. And they gave as much as they were able to, and even beyond their ability. They gave of themselves. They didn't do it because they were threatened. They didn't do it because they were browbeaten. They didn't do it because they were pressured. They did it because they loved the Lord and they wanted to give. They had learned the first essential of Christian giving. They gave of themselves first to the Lord and then to us. In the Macedonian Christian church, we see Romans 12, verse 1 exemplified, where it says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. After giving them the gospel message, Paul calls to the Romans to put themselves on the altar, so to speak, meaning to present their bodies as a living sacrifice. And he says, this is your reasonable service of worship. If you understand the great gift that God has given us in himself, if you understand that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for each one of us in this room, then you understand that he died to our trespasses and sins. You'll understand that Jesus, who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us. He took all of our sins upon his shoulders before he hung on that cross of, of Calvary for you and for me. That's why he says, Present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Scholars are here believing that Paul is alluding to the burnt offering of the Old Testament. You see, the burnt offering, the animals, they were cut and filleted and then laid on the altar. They were consumed by fire and that sweet smell well, I guess you could call it a sweet smell, went up to heaven. And that was the offering to God. And in this passage, God is telling us to do the same thing, to lay everything that we have on the altar, to give it to him. Why? Be, folks, it's his anyhow. It's not ours. It took me a long time to learn that. When I became a Christian, I used to write God a check for five bucks. I said, great job, Doug. And God still blessed me. God blessed us. But that's not what God wants. God has given us everything. Every breath we take is from God. Amen. How much do you appreciate that? Someone has said that the pocketbook or the wallet is a sort of acid test of the reality of our surrender to the Lord. 
Joel Betts is a writer for World Magazine, a very good writer. He said this one time. He says, grace has symptoms. If one does not have the symptoms, does one have the condition? Or less obliquely, people who have genuinely experienced God's grace will demonstrate liberally in their giving. If liberally in giving is not in evidence, have those people genuinely experienced God's grace? That's only a question you can answer. Giving ourselves to God does make a difference. It changes our perspective on whose money it is, on whose house it is, on whose car it is on whose clothes you wear. They're God's. They're not yours. Our life on this earth is just temporary. It's just a, a fleeting moment. I've often wondered what we're going to wear in heaven. <laughs> I really have. I don't know if I'm going to have a, a halo or wings. I'd like to think I'm going to fly from cloud to cloud, maybe see Ruth, maybe go behind the cloud and give her a little peck on the cheek. I don't know if that's even possible. But I do know, folks, that while I'm on this earth, everything I have is God's. And it took me, as I said, a long time for me to realize that. In verse 7, Paul applies this to the Corinthians. He challenges them. He says, bring to completion this act of grace on your part. They had started this collection a year before. It took them a year. And now he's saying, enough's enough, folks. Let's finish this up and help these Jews in, in Jerusalem that are poor. They need your help. Paul is saying to the Corinthians as well as to each of us that we excel in so many ways. I want you to excel in the grace of giving as well. How do you excel? Well, first of all, you excel in your faith, don't you? What is that? It's a continuing attitude of trusting Him for guidance day by day. That's how you excel in faith. We excel in our speech. We, by doing that, we have the expression or the, the ability to express ourselves to other folks, to share the good news. I use that one word, go, all the time. That's what we're to do, go and share the good news. That's how we excel in speech. We excel in knowledge. That means we understand spiritual truths. And we need to get into God's word daily and look at it. Read it. Hide it in our hearts. That's what God wants us to do. <laughs> and we take all these qualities, all these qualities, and then we can excel in the grace of giving. But now Paul moves on to present Jesus Christ as the supreme example of our giving. Our supreme example of giving is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Look what verses 8 and 9 tells us. Verse 8 says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that for you know the grace of our Lord Christ, or Jesus Christ, that through he, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Do you realize how rich you are? Huh. Do you realize how much we have living in these United States of America? As I said a couple of weeks ago, the poorest person in this room is 65% richer than most people in the world. 
we don't realize how much wealth we have. And that has been bestowed upon us by God himself. That's so very, very important. Because of time, I'm going to cut this short. You've got your notes in your, in your bulletins. You can take them home and look up the rest. The bottom line is this, folks. We give to God, not a tithe, but I believe out of proportionate giving. I believe, and I would ask you to challenge me on this, I'll, I'll tell you a story in a minute. I believe we start with a tithe, 10%. And as God blesses us, as individuals, as a congregation, then we give him proportionately above that. I've shared with you how we lost our entire savings years ago, before we went into ministry full time. As you can see, God is still blessed. And he does. Because we try to be faithful to him. And that's so very important. That's the key. Our faithfulness to God. When we first started going to Grace Church in South Bend, that was the fundamental church we were at for 22 years. We found out that that church was $5 million in the hole. This is in 1977. $5 million is a lot of money. There were times when the pastor would ask the congregation to give their whole paychecks, believe it or not. And there were those that did. But he put this challenge out. And it was a 90-day challenge, and I'm not putting it out. Except if you want to take it. He said this. He said, try at least tithing for 90 days. And if God doesn't bless you during that period of time, He'll give the money back. And that's what he did. We had a congregation of probably 1,200 at that time. Large church. And I can't tell you how many of the hundreds took that up. And you know how much money he gave back at the end of the 90 days? Zero. Not one dime. Do you know why? Because God blessed them. Because God blessed them. So I would, I would challenge you this morning that if you're not at least tithing, forget the proportional giving, but if you're not at least giving 10% of your income, test God for 90 days and see what happens. We're running $13,000, almost $14,000 in the red right now. That's hard. That's hard as a church. That's not good. Every week I put that figure down. Last week we had a wonderful offer. The week before it was like $800. That's not good. I don't care about my salary. I care about the upkeep of this church, though. And it takes a lot. So, hear my heart. My heart is, I want you to be blessed of God. I can tell you, Ruth and I can tell you story after story, how he has blessed us. And I don't say that, try to get a pat on the back. I say that because that's 
what we are. And that's what we should be as a congregation. If you want to see God bless you, then be obedient to him. Would you pray with me? Father, I haven't said everything I had in my notes, but that's okay. And I'm sure there are folks maybe upset with me this morning, and that's okay. But God, what we need to do is be obedient to you in all things. whether it's our attendance, whether it's our giving, whether it's our prayer life, whatever it is, God, help us. Help us to become more obedient. There are some folks that haven't set foot in this church for three, four, five weeks. And that blows my mind. Because I can't go a day without praying to you worshiping you. God, touch hearts and lives, I ask. I pray in the name of Jesus.